Hi, my name is Maria and welcome to my channel MH Books. And I got through nearly all of that to realise I'm not filming. So we're going to start again. So let's see, from the beginning, I am going to be doing a book haul. But because I like to put my books away as soon as I get them, see the double stacking problem as it is, because I would trip over them in this apartment if I didn't. Um, and because I think they get damaged by the budgies too. They, there I am. <laughs> it's just a little bunch of kids. Um, <laughs> I normally don't film book hauls, but as I do like watching them, and I do understand when people ask me, why don't you do it? I love watching book hauls. Yes, I love watching them too. I love watching when other people buy more books than they can read. And it makes me feel vindicated for doing the same thing. <laughs> So it's only fair that I do it too. And yeah, because we all love them. Um, so I thought maybe what I do is I film it as I go. We give each day's excuse for buying books. Okay, they're random excuses. And at the end of the year, maybe, we can see which was the most stupid excuse. No, brilliant excuse that I came up with for buying books. So today is the 24th of July. It is a Wednesday. I have finished up work for the evening and I decided, and I'm going on holidays um, for about the guts of two weeks, and I thought, oh, I'm on holidays, I can do what I like, I can um, buy books. So that's today's excuse for buying books. So oh, what I do is, that, by the way, is I'll join all these videos together and it, you know, so you'll probably actually get one at the end of my holidays because I probably have way enough books to put a, a book haul for that. So well, there's a decent number of books I should put up a video, but I should film as I go so I can put these away today. So um, the first one is for no nonfiction um, November, and the reason I bought it is something to read no nonfiction November. It is because I work in the Irish Motor Neuron Disease Association, so I work as an accountant, so I don't work directly work with any patients or clients. But I work in an organisation that deals with death all the time. And I also did a death course about two or three years ago in the Dublin Buddhist Centre on how to deal with death. So it is a subject that I'm interested in, um, that I'm aware of, but don't know enough about. Um, this one book comes highly ranked. It's by, so it's with the end in mind, Dying Death and Wisdom in the Age of Denial. And it's by Catherine Mannix, who I believe is a doctor. And a, can you see that? There, she's very shiny and age, it's silver. Um, so it's Catherine Mannix. Let me put it this way so you can see her name. Okay. <laughs> um, who works in palliative care. This is stories based upon some of her patients. And, you know... Um, books and what death is like and how it is uh, to be dealt with. It's written um, in short extracts and short stories. I'm going to be trying to read short stories every month. So when I do non-fiction, obviously, I have to get as close to short story format as I can. So this book will fulfill that. I do know one of my Goodreads friends said to um, read it in small pieces and then think about it, that you're almost better off reading, you know, one, one bit and a day or a week so that's probably how I'd pick it up um, not not for everybody but interested in reading that at the time when, when the time comes around um, waiting um, Ha Jing Ha Jing I, I'm not good at pronouncing Chinese names or any name but this book is set in the Mayo cultural revolution in China obviously which is Do Not Say We Have Nothing. Madeleine Thin's book is also set at the same, same time period. And I'm thinking about doing a reread of that next year and I thought this might be a really good book to read at the same time, um, which is why I picked it up. The story is about a man who has arranged marriage and it's about three people, his, his arranged wife, him, and a woman he meets. Um, and falls in love with, I think she's a nurse if I remember correctly, he and her cannot get together because of this time period in history without 
him getting a divorce from his wife first. So there, it's a love story where they're in love for at least 18 years with no intimacy possible. Uh, and we're not just talking sex here, we're talking no intimacy possible because of the time period involved. People will call this poignant and the best fiction of their year and things when they read it from a Goodreads um, friends. So I think I might, if I'm not picking up with a Madeline Tins um, book, I might be picking up, say, if it's a prompt for a, a, a readathon for romance, because it's probably more like the romance I would don't mind reading. There's always an exception to it. You say I don't read a romance, but there's an exception to everything. I actually read such a strange, wide variety of things. Okay, my name is Red. And again, I have the more than one book of this from this author, Arfan Pamuk. He wrote, wrote the originally in Turkish, if I remember. Um, this book, I picked it up because it's set in Istanbul in the 16th century, has a murder mystery. Um, I'm interested in Istanbul and its place between the East and West. It's during the Ottoman Empire, which is a piece of, which is something I'm interested in and wanted to read more of, and involves and discusses art and religion. Um, so some pretty good themes. Um, again, some of my um, Goodreads friends' favorite books. So I might pick this. Re actually, read this while I'm on holidays. So like, because it's it's a bit of a battered paperback, and that, that's one of the, my criteria. Okay, this book. You'll have probably have seen this if you watch everything that's on the channels, in which case more power to you. Um, because how do you have time to watch absolutely everything? I try on everybody's channel, but it is so much good content out there. You could actually watch all day. Um, and because I like to watch, I won't do other things while I'm watching book two. Um, anyway, I picked this up from the library, um, The Hunger. I will be splitting for the next few months my TBRs into horror only and kind of probably, you know, be, I'm saying literary fiction, but next, in August it will be women in, in, in translation. In September it will be just a category of authors set in the book in Dublin. In October it's Victober. November it's the um, non fiction November. So one half, one thing, and the other half is probably going to be horrors. The horrors might be themed as well. There's a reason for that, and I'll get into that in a different video. Um, so the ho the hunger um, is fulfilling. Is it a scary prompt? Okay, I'm trying to work out, is there such a thing as a horror story? So it's based on a true story. It has, is written by a woman, Alma Katsu, yes, she is a woman. I didn't get this wrong. I've gotten this wrong with what Grady Hendrix. Didn't I say Grady Hendrix? I was a woman. She's a man or he's a man. Um, it's based on a true story. So is that make, it's, it's based on the Donner Party with some, it's a fictionalized event of the Donner Party with some supernatural elements. But this is the library copy and this is the haul. And I picked up a library copy about on Saturday. This is Wednesday. I also picked up the actual copy. Haven't read it yet. Not planned to read it till next month, but just had to have it. Turn back or you will die. You know what I mean? So I mean, like this book is going for it. It is going for it. So will I find this scary? Who knows? Well, that's the end of this bit of the haul. Oh my God, eight minutes. Excuse number two. I met the author. Therefore, I had to buy the book. Can't prove it at the moment, except for the film of um, the author reading from the book, because the book went over back over to Ireland with my sister because she was coming back first and she had a car, uh, as she was going over and she was going over in the ferry, so it, um, it didn't interfere with luggage allowances. But of course now she's gone off camping again with cubs, so I don't have access to her book at the moment. So you're going to have to just trust me. And the fact I do have video evidence, which I'll show after this of the author reading the book. The book in question is Greetings from Bury Park, Safra's Manzur, um, which I probably just butchered his name on, sorry, again, especially when you meet somebody, this is really embarrassing. Um, and you can probably see there, um, it's, a, it's his memoir, which inspired his writing of Blinded by the Light. He's fictionalized his life, he's given himself you know, a few better things, better arguments, 
Vinegar of Friends and Things for the fictional version of his life. Um, but really, Blind by the Light is going to be released within a few days in most cinemas, movie theatres so you're in the States or in Canada or somewhere. Um, and if you weren't convinced that Bruce Springsteen knew the answer to every question, you will be by the end of this movie. He can solve anything. Um, that's all I'm saying, but it's really good. Um, I've seen there's a premiere, um, surprise premiere in, um, uh, what's the name of the cinema? Cine World. And yeah, it's one of those secret screenings you don't even see. Bloody brilliant. Really enjoyed it. Got the book. That's not, I'm not wasting that excuse on this book. I met the author, therefore I had to buy the book. That's this excuse. Not wasting the, I saw the movie and had to buy the book. That's for saving that one. So, um, <laughs> I will close up with an excerpt of the author reading from the book and then I'm gonna upload this book haul as is, the UK one. Well, this was bought in the UK, by the way. Um, I met him in Yorkshire. But the, U the rest of the UK one will go up together um, because it has sort of a, 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 a second video that goes with it. Oh, too confusing to explain. Anyway, I hope whatever books that you've bought, borrowed, lent out to people and gotten back, um, hopefully not stolen, that you've enjoyed them. And until next time, bye. All right. Um, I'm standing out here beside the pallet stage before I see the next show. You can see it got a bit wet over the last couple of days. Um, today's author talk is um, Safra Smanzor, you know me and names. Um, and just reminding myself, I'm looking at the program. I'll have to show you the program in a sec. Um, whose memoir was recently made into movie, Blinded by the Light, which is a fabulous movie you should really see. It'll make you like Bruce Springsteen if you never did. And a great um, author for a music festival. Um, I'm sad inside this beautiful oak tree, by the way. And yeah, so that will be in about an hour's time, but first to the pal stage. I didn't know it then in that first week at Sixth Form College during the autumn of 1987 that my life would be changed forever by the boy sitting on his own in the upper common room with his eyes closed and his head rocking to the music he was hearing on headphones stretched over his maroon turban. He wore a faded denim jacket with its collar up and his clenched fists were beating out a silent rhythm on an invisible drum kit. He had the hairiest face of any 16 year old I'd ever seen. The first time I saw him, it was lunchtime. The college radio station was pumping up, pump up the volume. And I was in the common room with Kate, who I'd met whilst working during the summer at a sandwich factory. The boy was tugging at his headphones, trying to free them from the bandages of his turban when he spotted my friend. Hey Kate, how's it going? He said before offering me his hand and saying simply, hey mate, how's it going? I'm a Molak, but my mates call me Roops. My new college was predominantly Asian, but before then I had virtually no Asian friends. I saw the sons of my father's friends occasionally, but Lee Manor High School was almost entirely white. And when I was around Asians, I tended to feel a bit of a fraud. I'd always felt grateful I wasn't Sikh because being Asian was hard enough without a religion that insisted believers wear enormous bandages on their head and forsake cutting facial hair. Within seconds of meeting a Molak, it was obvious that while he might have looked like Chewbacca in jeans, he had the confident air of someone completely oblivious to how ridiculous he looked. Hey, I'm Safraz. What are you listening to? I asked him, noticing the dog tag around his neck and the metal stars and stripes badge on his jacket. Molak stopped fiddling with his headphones. What am I listening to, he said, as if it was the most inane inquiry ever made. I'm listening to the truth, my friend. I'm listening to wisdom. I'm listening to philosophy. I am listening to the man, the boss. By the time I was 16, I considered myself to be reasonably knowledgeable about pop music and about Bruce Springsteen, I knew this much. He had sung Born in the USA and Asian boys from Luton had no business listening to him. These two pieces of ammunition, these two pieces of information provided me with all the ammunition I needed. What the hell are you listening to Bruce Springsteen for? Isn't he just a millionaire who goes around dressed in lumberjack shirts, pretending to care about the working class? Don't start arguing with Roops, said Kay. You're not going to win. I was someone who loved arguing so much that I actually looked forward to when the Jehovah's Witnesses came round. So no further argument was needed. 
But seriously, doesn't Bruce Springsteen make like rock music? Molak bristled. And also, I said, he's just really old. He's in his 30s. What are you listening to middle-aged music for? <laughs> Molak stood up. Listen, my friend, he said, Bruce Springsteen is a direct, direct connection to everything that is meaningful and significant in life. And what are you listening to anyway? Rick Astley, Bros, let me tell you something. Bruce is better than all of those.